Hello, and welcome to another Monday. Remember, Monday is a fiction, and you can get rid of it if you really want to. On this week's docket, we're going to talk about Justice Anthony Kennedy, some of the cases he's decided recently, and his decision to retire from the Supreme Court. We're going to talk very briefly about uh, the shootings at a newspaper in Maryland, and a new challenge to FOSTA SESTA, a little bit about Trump's wonderful little trade war, and finally, the possibility of a comet impact 14,000 years ago, and what this might have to do with stuff happening today. This is Social Justice Alchemy. So first up, Anthony Kennedy. There have been a lot of hot takes flying around on this one, describing how this is one of the worst things that could have happened. And yeah, that's kind of true. Not entirely true. It would have been worse if somebody further left had decided to retire. The worst possible thing regarding the Supreme Court would be if something happened to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I don't think she's going to retire anytime soon. Not while there's any chance that uh, Trump could appoint her replacement. Now, Kennedy retiring is not great, but one of the things you'll see floating around out there about him is that he's a moderate. Um, no. Just plain old-fashioned, no. He is absolutely not a moderate. Like the rest of the conservatives on the court, he is a far right-wing individual. He is not moderate. He happens to be a swing vote on a couple of key issues, because he has decent opinions, not great, about gay people and abortion. But other than that, he is far right-wing. He is to the right of Roberts on most things. For example, three cases whose decisions came down uh, this past week are Trump versus Hawaii, the National Institute of Family and Life Advocates versus Becerra, and Yanis versus the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Council 31. That is, these are the travel ban case, the crisis pregnancy center case, and the union case. In all three of these cases, Kennedy sided with the conservative majority. He sided with the conservatives in order to uphold Trump's travel ban. He sided with the conservatives in order to say that crisis pregnancy centers are allowed to lie to people. And he sided with the conservatives when it came to fucking over unions. Kennedy is not a moderate. When it comes to actually discussing these decisions, I'm going to leave that to the excellent, excellent work done by uh, Andrew Torres over at uh, Opening Arguments. If you're not listening to that podcast, you absolutely should be. Uh, they're brilliant, and they're funny, and they're, they're really good at law stuff. So definitely go give them a listen. They are, if they, if they haven't broken down this stuff already and I just haven't gotten to it, that's entirely possible. But if they haven't done it already, then they will this Friday. That's just the sort of thing they do. But I want to point out, just very briefly, first off, that Andrew Torres' opening arguments way back in March of last year when Trump first put out his first travel ban, he predicted that the court would uphold the right of the president to make a travel ban like this because Congress gave the president really broad powers when it came to deciding who could and could not come into the United States. So absolutely no surprises there. The, the reason it uh, took so, it took more than a year. It took, I think, 15 months now. It's almost July, March. Yeah, yeah, it took, uh, you know, 15 months, more than a year for it to finally work its way through the courts and take effect is because the Trump administration is so goddamn incompetent that they just, they, they, they couldn't manage to do something. It was fully within their authority to do. But the, the court, you know, just did what uh, right-wing people just seem to love to do is just make shit up ignore facts when they're inconvenient and make things up when they have to, in order to pretend that this wasn't a Muslim ban. Chief Justice Roberts just said, you know what, we don't find any reason to think that this is a Muslim ban, despite the fact that they called it that repeatedly. By the way, that's something that lower courts had said repeatedly, you know, in their opinions. This is why, one of the reasons why we're putting an injunction on this ban and saying it's unconstitutional. But Roberts went ahead and ignored that, and Kennedy signed on with it. Kennedy was, Kennedy was okay with that. Although he did write a concurrence. He's a little bit more reasonable sometimes. He, he just said that, you know, the courts have the right to review the ban. He didn't object to Roberts, you know, just making shit up. 
for the crisis pregnancy centers, people are allowed to lie. They're, they don't have to, in other words, tell. They, you can't require them to say, we don't have any doctors or nurses on staff. They're, they're allowed to lie. Kennedy was, was normally pretty okay with making abortions sometimes a little bit possible. He was also okay with people being lying assholes. Okay, crisis pregnancy centers just lie to pregnant women and do everything they can to delay them until it's too late for them to get abortions. That's all they do. That's what they exist for. He supported, once again, uh, the conservative majority in enabling these assholes. And then finally, the, the, the last one, he signed on with motherfucking Alito. Uh, Alito uh, wrote the opinion on this one, uh, and this was, you know, in their attempt to destroy unions. Because everyone knows that people working for the public sector get paid so much they don't need a union, right? <sighs> okay, so losing Kennedy is kind of a blow, because he was a little bit reasonable on some things, but it's not like he was a moderate. He was in no way a moderate. Kennedy was far right-wing, who happened to be moderate in a very limited way. Losing him is bad because it means we'll get another Gorsuch, another Thomas, another Alito, another extreme right-wing ideologue who is going to ignore jurisprudence in order to write whatever opinion he feels he can write. Any, he'll, he'll go as far as he can. That's what Gorsuch does, is going as far as they can in order to get the result they want. And that's what we're going to get. Unless the Democrats find a spine and stand up to this and maybe get some Republican allies. I really doubt that's going to happen. But it's it's possible. Maybe someone like Flake or, uh, or McCain will step up and do the right thing. But I doubt it. We're going to get another Gorsuch. Another 45-year-old asshole is going to be on the court for another 40 or 50 years. Which brings us to the next bit. Another thing that's been flying around a lot is people criticizing those who didn't vote or who voted third party in this past election. If you said that or thought or, you know, considered maybe that there's no difference between Clinton and Trump, uh, you're wrong. Clinton was right wing. I mean, that's but that's all we have in the U.S. Right wing or far right wing. Those are our two parties. I understand when you're on the left that that's very, very frustrating, but the Democrats are not as actively evil as the Republicans. There is a significant difference between the two parties. Clinton would not have given us Gorsuch. She's not going to give us, she wouldn't have given us, I should say, whoever Trump will give us. She would have faced a hostile Congress, no way about that. It would have been very difficult for her to get anything done, but... The only reason Trump has had difficulty getting anything done is not because of the protesters. It's because his administration is so incompetent and so corrupt that they just can't get out of their own way long enough to get anything done. Clinton would have had trouble because of obstruction from a hostile Republican Congress, that's all. And she definitely, definitely wouldn't have given us this far right-wing court that's going to be far right-wing, extreme far right-wing, for decades to come. If you vote third party in the U.S., your vote is useless. Our system of elections means we have two parties. We can only have two parties. A third party will either destroy and replace one of the main parties, or it will be destroyed in itself. And if it gets popular enough, then the third party can find some elements of his platform adopted into one of the main parties. That's it. If you look at the history of the U.S., that's what you see. It's because of the math of the way our electorals electoral system works. If you vote third party, you've thrown away your vote. If you want to vote, and you want your vote to count, and you want to pull this country to the left, then you need to vote in primaries. You need to vote for candidates who promise to reform, no, no, not even reform, but radically alter, to replace, fundamentally, our system of elections. Because what we have now is corrupt and corrupting it is just plain broken. It is awful. It's what, in the end, gave us Trump. Voting third party doesn't help anyone or anything. Not voting is just as bad. I can understand for a lot of people why they wouldn't vote. Because, again, our system has been gerrymandered and broken and rigged against certain populations. If you're poor, and black, you know, you're working three jobs and there's going to be a five-hour wait at the polling station, you simply can't 
vote. And yeah, I don't blame you for not even trying. But I'm also not talking to you on this one. There's a difference between not being able to vote and choosing not to vote. If you choose not to vote, then fuck you. If you can't vote, damn, that sucks. And I feel for you. And I'm, I, I don't, I'm not mad at you. I'm, I'm just mad at the people who didn't vote against Trump, but could have. Remember, you know, Trump won the presidency thanks to only a few tens of thousands of votes, despite the fact that Clinton had millions of votes on him. You know, he won a few key states by just a handful of votes. Yes, it's your vote. You're allowed to use it however you want. But you have a responsibility to your neighbors to use it well. Enough of that. Let's go ahead and move on. Capital Gazette. This was another mass shooting. A man went into a newspaper office, blocked the door, and managed to uh, murder five people. He did this a day after Milo Yiannopoulos called on people to enact violence against journalists. Milo Yiannopoulos, you may or may not be aware, is just a worthless piece of shit. He's a far right, he's a neo-Nazi, and he, uh... He's managed to maintain some of his popularity despite committing the worst sin imaginable and saying it's okay to uh, rape white children. Well, white male children. That's the only sin, really, in uh, neo-Nazi eyes. Well, you know, there are other other sins. But it's the only one that they could not forgive him for. Now, there's no evidence that uh, Milo's comment in any way triggered this. It was just very, very bad timing. It it serves to highlight what an awful piece of shit he is. But the fact is, Trump also called for violence against journalists. Trump called for violence against any opponents. Trump as a fascist. Uh, But the thing is, there's no connection between any of that and this event. It appears the shooter had been in conflict with the newspaper for some time regarding their coverage of a case he was involved in, a criminal harassment case against him. And so for years now, for since 2012, it seems that he has been going at the newspaper and uh, social media. This seems to be a guy who uh, was somewhat unstable. He was let go from a job uh, in the capital area due to security concerns. Apparently the government asked for him to be let go from a job he had, and he was unhappy about that and sued his former employer over that. He also had a criminal harassment a case, and so it appears that uh, you know, this guy was ramping up in terms of you know, social justice and socialism. You know, what flaws does this point out in the U.S.? I mean, a- apart from our ridiculous fetish for guns and the fact that we shouldn't have streets flooded with guns anyway, what does this point out about the U.S.? Nothing new, I don't think. I just, uh, I don't think that this incident has anything to do with the right. I mean, the right definitely enables these assholes, uh, makes it possible, but uh, he's not a right-wing ideologue in any sense, I don't think. Nothing, nothing really jumps out of me. Next up, FOSTA, SESTA. For those who are unfamiliar, uh, this is a a set of laws that it's claimed were meant to uh, end sex trafficking. That is, they wanted to make places like Craigslist and Backpage and and similar uh, responsible for... Uh, illegal content posted on there, which is a pretty big change from formerly. You know, they recognize that uh, there's just so much content, it's really impossible for those bigger places to uh, police it individually like that. But uh, FOSTA and SESTA changed that, and uh, they made them liable, legally responsible for the illegal content, specifically regarding prostitution. So... Craigslist and Backpage and similar closed all those things down, meaning that where before sex workers could screen their clients, you know, and make sure that uh, they weren't setting up a date with a violent or dangerous asshole or somebody that they had worked with before who they had, you know, gotten rid of. Now, um, they're not. They're not able to do that sort of stuff. Craigslist's personals have been shut down, uh, Backpage likewise. Basically, this has forced sex workers back out on the street. Uh, It's made their work much, much more dangerous. Which, in the end, does the exact opposite of what the Act purports to want to do. Okay, The the, the Acts, the laws, you know, they say they're opposed to sex trafficking. But when you force sex workers out on the street, this makes them much more vulnerable to being trafficked. Pimps will come after them. Pimps are, you know, they, they don't actually protect these women. They're just parasites who traffic 
And, and I shouldn't say women, because there are lots of people who go into uh, sex work. But the stated intention of these laws is different from the actual intention. Because the actual intention of these laws is to punish sex workers. It is to criminalize sex. It is to make this work as dangerous as possible. Because sex workers are a threat to the rich and powerful. So the more marginalized sex workers are, the easier they are to control. The reason they're a threat is because these the, the, the people I'm talking about, the people they're a threat to, are the ones who hate sex, or claim to, and want to uh, control women's bodies very directly, very thoroughly. And because they you know, routinely engage sex workers, they are routinely at risk for being exposed as vile hypocrites. So the more marginalized sex workers are, the easier they are to control, and the more unlikely it becomes that these uh, hypocritical assholes will be exposed. So in this particular news item, the Electronic Frontier Foundation is challenging Foster and um, says that it's a poorly written law that will actually undermine its efforts to do what it wants and that it trespasses on free speech. I don't know. Uh, I have no idea. Again, I don't know if this will make it onto opening arguments. I hope it does. So I don't know if their lawsuit has any sort of merit. But I hope they succeed, you know, because... Sex workers deserve safety and security, just like anyone else. And now, hopping over to BBC, we have uh, Canada will not back down over their tariffs. Tariffs are such a stupid fucking idea. This trade war is such a stupid fucking idea. The reason so much manufacturing has moved out of the country, has moved overseas, is not because of the cost of goods. It's because of the cost of labor. Because the people involved in the system, involved in capitalism, are not complete monsters, wages tended to go up during those brief boom years right after the you know, Second World War. And people, we had a middle class, is what I'm saying. But then, uh, in 1972, uh, somehow, uh, you know, with the re-election of Nixon, we saw a complete decoupling of wages and productivity. Uh, wages, you know, immediately stopped going up. They stagnated. They've been stagnant ever since 72. Productivity has continued going up and up and up. And the system that we live under, capitalism, Henry Ford got it exactly backward when he said these to the purpose of the industrialist is to sell the highest quality goods possible at the lowest price possible while paying the highest wages possible. That's just completely backwards. The goal is to sell the lowest quality good possible at the highest price possible while paying the lowest wages possible. And because wages in the U.S. were relatively high, were incredibly high, I should say, they weren't even relatively high, they were just incredibly high, compared to the slave labor you can get overseas, that's why manufacturing has been getting outsourced over and over again, and it's why wages have continued to suffer under negative pressure. Because the system wants to minimize costs, and that includes the cost of labor. And insofar as it is humanly possible, it is pushing price, pushing wages down until eventually it reaches rock bottom, you know, the absolute minimum, until it reaches slave wages, in other words, the sort of wages that you can pay overseas. Because we have minimum wage laws, we can't reach those yet. But uh, I foresee a time, you know, as we, you know, slide further and further right, when those laws will either be repealed or declared unconstitutional by the courts. It's entirely conceivable. This trade war is not going to succeed because the trade war doesn't target the cost. The intent, Trump is basically pandering to his base with this, the intent is purportedly to bring jobs back to the U.S., but it cannot do that because it's not targeting the actual cause. The cause is the slave wages that can be paid overseas. If we want to save the workers, we have to save all workers. If we want to save workers and working jobs and working wages, we have to target our tariffs not randomly in order to raise the price of goods overseas. All that will do is just continue to push factories overseas so that they can get the cheaper good, the cheaper raw materials overseas. No, if we want to have any sort of success here, we need to target the wages being paid overseas. We need to put tariffs not in this random, well, I don't know if there's no system that Trump is using, so not in the random way Trump is doing on goods. 
we need to put it on any goods that do not pay the equivalent of the U.S. minimum wage. We need to force the prices of all goods up and get it in the form of taxes rather than profit. Because then those those taxes can be used to build infrastructure, not just here in the U.S., although they will be primarily used here in the U.S., but we could also turn it into infrastructure overseas. Education, clean water, roads, bridges, things like that, so that those people will have better living conditions. And we can bring the world up to you know U.S. standard in terms of infrastructure, as well as, hopefully, with this sort of pressure um, with wages. I don't know, even then, that that sort of tariff would be possible. I mean, if it could even theoretically succeed. I've never seen anyone suggest it. It's just something I sort of came up with on my own. And unfortunately, I'm not an economist, so I have no idea if that could work. What I do know is that Trump's trade war won't. It isn't working. All it's doing is harming the U.S. economy and, as with Harley-Davidson, forcing more manufacturers overseas, costing more American jobs. Moving on, finally, to uh, the science article. This one is from sciencenews.org. It's, uh, why won't this debate about an ancient cold snap die? Despite mainstream opposition, a controversial comet impact hypothesis persists. Uh, this is a uh, an ongoing debate uh, about what's known as uh, the Younger Dryas, I believe it's called. A cold snap that occurred about th- 13,000 years ago. We were coming out of uh, the last ice age, things were warming up, and then suddenly, boom, a deep chill for about a thousand years, and then uh, the warming resumed. So the, uh, the, the brief cold snap is called the Younger Dryas. The reason this caught my eye is because I know that it is part of um, not just the scientific debate about why this cold snap occurred, but it's also part of a larger cultural debate. Depending on you know what you've read and what sort of things you're aware of, this has shown up in both Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel, uh, but also in Charles Mann's 1491, both of them in relation to the extinction events in uh, the New World. Because this, this cold snap coincides, roughly, with the, the mass extinction event of large land mammals in uh, the Americas. Now, Jared Diamond, you should be very careful about his books, because I know that anthropologists kind of despise them. They're just full of errors. Along with uh, this story, I'm going to go ahead and uh, post a link to a Reddit, <laughs> a Reddit uh, article that includes a list to a, a bunch of links to uh, anthropologists criticizing guns, germs, and steel. Jared Diamond talked about how the absence of those large mammals made it difficult or impossible for people to do uh, any sort of real agriculture in the New World. Charles Mann actually discussed the uh, the the social aspects of the controversy. One of the reasons people criticize guns, germs, and steel is because it's still kind of race essentialist talks about how everything is determined by geography which kind of includes race and a lot of people have a lot of problems with uh, his book and charles mann you know discusses things with native americans who often find the uh, uh the suggestion the idea the hypothesis that overhunting caused those mass extinctions uh to be an insulting attack sort of you were too stupid to manage your uh what you were given therefore it's your fault you didn't develop agriculture therefore it's your fault you didn't you couldn't withstand europe i think it would be too big a coincidence for the arrival of human beings on a new continent separated by water from uh, africa and eurasia i think it would be too big a coincidence for their arrival to coincide (laughs) with uh, mass extinction in the case of coming to uh, the uh, the new world people make a lot of noise about the land bridge I don't know how necessary the land bridge was. I mean, the people of Polynesia made it to Hawaii, right? Hawaii is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. There is nothing nearby. They still colonized that. The people of the Pacific Islands were incredible navigators. Uh, I don't think the small barrier of the Bering Strait would have been a huge problem for them. It's a, a few dozen miles. Yes, it's over the horizon, but it's not a huge feat of navigation like the thousands of miles necessary to get to Hawaii. But, you know, I'm not uh, hugely knowledgeable about this. This particular uh, scientific article talks about what might have caused the uh, the Younger Dryas cold snap. And people have suggested an event like Tunguska, basically a, a meteorite or comet exploding in the atmosphere above the ground. 
think about it uh, in terms of you know an object falling at uh, terminal velocity i mean something coming in from outer space just in incredible speeds there's not necessarily a huge difference between hitting the air and hitting the ground it is entirely possible for something to basically explode which is what happened at tunguska and leveled a big patch of forest so what they're suggesting and have been suggesting for about a decade is that a larger comet broke up over the north american ice sheet which would have or could have uh, filled the air with uh, particulates and just massively disrupted things there are other uh, suggestions out there like the melting of the ice sheets caused a disruption in the flows of ocean waters which changed the way things warmed and caused a temporary cooling period things like that uh, this is controversial in much the same way that the asteroid impact hypothesis was for the dinosaurs Unlike the uh, impact hypothesis of the dinosaurs, uh, this one, as I understand, is not as well supported by evidence. The dinosaur impact hypothesis was well supported even before they found the impact crater. Uh, this one doesn't quite have the support, and the mainstream scientific community doesn't care for it, as I understand. But still, uh, science is interesting, whether you're talking about uh, modern physics or the hunt for, you know, evidence for of things that happened uh, tens of thousands of years ago i personally um don't have a dog in this fight and, and i personally don't know enough about impacts or ice ages to be able to uh, uh make any sort of statement with any kind of authority <laughs> it's just kind of interesting to me all right and that will do it i hope you enjoy the rest of your monday such as it is or the rest of your week i know how podcasts can pile up just a reminder, I post this both on my YouTube channel, John Brockman, and on iTunes as a podcast. And also on my YouTube channel, I practice the guitar every night. If you have any interest in watching someone who's not very good at the guitar, learn how to play the guitar. I also take part in another podcast, the Dungeons and Debacles podcast, hosted by my friend Kevin where I and a, a, an adventuring group are seeking to unleash an ancient evil and possibly destroy the world. So if you found any of this sort of stuff interesting, if you'd like to you know, give me a hand, give me a boost, maybe like, share, subscribe, leave a positive review somewhere, that, uh, that apparently really helps the algorithms. So thanks for listening. I'm your social justice alchemist, John Brockman, and I'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.